Here there are a few off-grid homes dotted among the Pohutukawa trees. And in one of them, you'll find Sandra and Alfonso Hey Hey. And we've got solar, got solar power as well. That's what our lights are. I met Sandra and Alfonso having a coffee in town, and they invited me to come out to their home, a remote scallop-shaped bay lined with white sandy beaches, separated by headlands. Wow. Look at this. This is your routine. Come up here every it's the golden hour, just before the sun goes down, and there's a nip in the breeze coming off the ocean. A tea party by the sea. <laughs> How beautiful. The cups and saucers are laid out on a lace tablecloth. There's local honey, homemade bread, and a vase of flowers. Sandra's family has lived in this bay for generations, and Alfonso can trace his roots to the original inhabitants of Martha's Vineyard in the US. His great grandfather was a whaler who jumped ship near Kitty Kitty in the late 1800s. I'm a descendant from the Wampanoag tribe. My tupuna there is, his name is uh, Marcellus, and he came over on a whaling boat, him and a friend, and um, he didn't like the way he was treated on the boat. So they escaped. Sandra and Alfonso met in Whangare and moved back to Sandra's Turangawaiwai in the 1980s. In those days, he took the kids out on horseback to meet the school bus. The track was much rougher then. 1989, when we came home, we, I used to um, horse the kids out of, um, out of the bay to the, to the bus stop, which was eight about kilometers. eight kilometres. So I had three horses. I was the lead horse. I used to take the kids out to the bus stop and come back, take them into the sea, have a wash, let them go, have a kai, and then do the same thing in the afternoon. Yeah, so have some of that. Just, just pluck some of that, put some of that in there, and then there's a hot water here. And then we've got some... We're about to, and then you've got the honey right next door to you. From your um, own honeybees? Yeah, yeah, we had honeybees out here for a bit and somebody else come on. Please, help Ooh. yourself. Oh. Oh, a bit of that and my tea. Oh, gorgeous. The couple are among the kaitiaki of this place, which has a long history. Of course, Sandra Hei Hei Taku Ingoa. Uh, no Taimaro um, Taku Kainga, uh, Te Hapu o Te Aukiwa, o Ngā Te Kahu Ke Whangaroa Te Iwi. I am 17 generations of the Mamaru Waka um, and my tūpuna, so that's, that's my genealogy link to this beautiful place. 17 generations on 17 this land. Generations. Yep, 17 generations. The Waka came in here? Yes, the Waka did come in here and in other parts of Monganui as well, but for us, yeah, that's our tupuna corridor here. Sandra points out places where her tupuna would have lived and gardened and looked after their bay. Uh, to the left we have a pa kainga, like a village, and that place is called Tuanui. We have another little bay that's called Ngafanua. And there's another little bay that we call Omata. And then we've got a marakai, which is a place where they did gardening. And then we've got Rotofiro. And then we've got Te Arai, which is in the middle of the bay here at the Pahutakawas. And then to my uh, Tahamato, which is to the right, we have um, Oweka, a little point. And then we have Okawo, which is another little shingly bay. That's where they did a lot of whaling, um, hauling the whales in there. You can still see some of the old ship nails they had hammered into the rocks. And it's not a big bay, yet all these small places have special meaning. They do. It's a place where our people, the old people used to do their, their living, really, their mahi to live. You know, they grew their food, they did their gardening, they harvested their korari, their flaxes and um, they just lived and breathed the land that's here. And then going out to the front here is a place called um, Tutu Tarakihi, which means you're looking down on all the little fishes that are swimming. Again, a lot of our place names here and a lot of these pars represent little stories, so we call them pūrāko. So there's always a corridor to a name and a meaning. 
it's like a person had a meaningful name as well. So. And looking yeah. higher up, overlooking the bay, several par sites. When I say they're par sites, they're actually little homes. If you imagine a house, and when you look back in Māori um, history and tradition, you're actually looking at um, a landscape that very similar to Egypt, like a pyramid, but you're just looking at hills now that, and if underneath the scrub, you would see um, platforms and terraces and pits, and that's where the old people used to live. We're standing on a sort of raised dune area. What happened here? Um, so this is a part of a um, the sand dune that you see, the rolling sand dune in front of um, us here in the bay. Um, that was a part of a tsunami back in the 1800s. Um, it was an area that was gardened, but it was also used um, to do some um, kumara and rua, rua pits as well, just because it's very sandy, thick with sand, and used to have fern root in that where they used to store some of the rewais and the kumaras in that um, historically. A rich area for mahinga kai? Absolutely, but everything was done in a sustainable manner. bit saddened when I see some of the practices that are used today. Um, we struggle a lot now for a lot of our kaimoana because of the ongoing um, commercial boats that we see out, long liners. They fish whenever. In the old days, the old people only fished on the moon, on the maramataka. They only put their nets out at certain times. They didn't leave them out for days in the water. Um, all those sorts of things and those practices aren't, aren't respected anymore and those values, and, and that's really hard. You know, you have recreational fishing and then you have commercial fishing and it just strips the coast. So we've been home now over 35 years and we've seen the difference, the depletion of our kaimoana. So and how often would you get a feed from the sea here? About once a fortnight we'd get a little bit, you know, and when I mean a little bit I only mean like three or four things because that's all you need, you know, you don't need to catch bin loads or sacksfuls or bucketfuls, you just need enough to eat. We try our best to do it according to um, the maramataka. This place will sustain us if you give it the respect that it's, it's needed. Sandra has held leading roles with her marae and iwi. With the internet, she can carry on her governance roles and her interest in archaeology and history, alongside caring for the people and the land. Are you seeing many people come back? Not in large, large lots, but we do see those who are searching, searching for a connection, searching for their identity, sometimes just searching to survive. So there's a lot of work to be done by our iwis in general, um, and by a lot of our families, because a lot of our families are really um, disconnected from the land, um, disconnected from their um, history and their traditions and our values, our, the old people's values. There's a lot of healing in that to be done, really. You mentioned earlier that after COVID, you did see a return of people to this small bay and to this area. Yes, we did. We had a huge, big influx. And then when it sort of calmed down a bit, I think for some of them, the lifestyle was a bit hard. So, um, well, it wasn't for them. Because Taimata was not a material place. You need to take it for what it is, not come here and change it, not come here and think that you can make a million dollars out of this place. You know, it's not about making money, it's about, it's just so beautiful. You have to appreciate what we have. How does it work if you want to come and live here? Um, usually you have to fuck a papa, so you fuck a papa to the whenua. Um, you will there'll be a tupuna name that you will fuck a papa to. It's about the Fano afing and supporting you to come home and live. Um, so that's how you basically come back. They call it shareholding and listings and things through the Māori land court, but that's another co-papa and a beast within itself. <laughs> So, um, but I'm a strong believer in um, whakapapa, it's tūpuna whenua. Um, to me, in terms of things that are ownership, we aren't, we're just caretakers. Every human being is a caretaker. How long do you live for? That's the time you have.
the buildings that are here now are obviously different from what was here before. You had an old Absolutely. school, an old church. You even had, yep. you had your marae, which was moved. Yes, yes. So we, um, we did have a marae that was put up so that the old people could have a, um, a voice in the time of the land that was taken. So basically Taimaro uh, was given a native reserve in 1865. The old people then petitioned because a majority of their land was taken between Whangaroa, Taupo Bay, all the way out to Monganui. Frederick Manning and um, Judge White were the key people of that particular area, and our tupunas, um, Paiara, Petera, there was quite a few of them in that, that time. They were the ones that stood to speak about the um, long-term occupation that the people had here and their struggles and about them trying to maintain their their rights really to living and breathing the land that they had always done. So it was about trying to protect their old burial sites, trying to protect the places where they grew their kai, um, trying to protect um, the resources that were here because the resources were being stripped. Um, so the marae was built late 1800s um, that became a vocal point where they were, they also integrated a lot with the Catholic Church. Catholic Church was involved, uh, Katurikas, we all became um, real staunch um, believers, uh, our, our tupunas did, and right down to our families today of the Catholic faith. Um, we had a church here and we had a school. Uh, that was like 1905, um, the school started, it left here 1936. Um, in them days life was pretty hard so the priest at that particular time decided that they'd move the settlement or the church and the school to Kaio, to Whangaroa, to a place called Waitaruke so that the children have more access to facilities, resources, because you're pretty isolated out here when you think about it. It's a long <coughs> way from a, it is, anywhere, it is. it's a bit of a drive and the road is, yeah. is pretty uh, rough. And, and in them days, it was only a, it was a horse and a cart. Um, my grandfather records in his diary, oh, the boxing on my wheel um, was broken, so I had to stop and fix it. I was trying to work out what is a boxing in a wheel. Then I realised it was a horse and cart, so, yeah, you know, just another era. Getting up that hill yeah, with a horse and cart yeah. would have been quite something. Yeah, and then, um, of course, there was walker ferrying, so everything went out by barge. During all this time, between 1865 and 1930, our people were being educated, learning how to read and write so they could fight for the grievances of the land lost all around them, and trying to maintain their um, tinoranga tiratanga, their mana motahake, which is just their living, basic living rights of how they want to live on the land their own way, not being governed by someone else or having been told what to do, you know but mainly it was around there, the, the resources that were here because it was just being stripped at the time. So Sandra, what do you see your role as today here in the Bay? Um, I see myself as a, um, as a kaitiaki, uh, ahika, someone who stays home to keep the fires burning, um, someone who's here to manaki, Manaki people who come, because that's what the old people used to do. Um, when I have a reflection of that, sometimes I think they did that too much. They were too kind, too nice, because they had so much taken from them. But I will continue to maintain what they did, because that's very important, you know. Um, and I love doing that. I love, those are my fond memories of how they were. As soon as someone come, you had to put the jug on and make a cup of tea and pull out all the fine china while well, we had the plastic cups, but anyway. <laughs> well, I can attest to that. We've been sitting here looking at the bay with the fine china, the tablecloth, <laughs> and the homemade jams and the homemade bread. Yeah. And what a special welcome it's been. Um, yeah. Look, the sun is going down now. It is, it is. It's getting a bit chilly in that now. But um, yeah, so that's my role to transfer everything that I know to my children and grandchildren and to the next generation. Values of this place here, 
these stories and things I'm telling you are so important for them because it's who they are. It's what sustained our tūpuna and generations before them. Without these places, we wouldn't be here. So I appreciate the hard living they had, making things out of nothing and surviving. And yeah, let's go inside. I was speaking there to Sandra Heihei in Taimaro Bay, in Te Taitokoro, Northland. And for Sandra, Matariki is a time to reset, a new year, new friends and a new chapter. Head to our webpage for some glimpses of that beautiful place. <laughs> <laughs> 